Good morning. Today is the second Sunday before Lent. That is Sexagesima Sunday, and this is a service of morning prayer. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The Venite. O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 62. Uh -huh. My soul truly waiteth still upon God, for of him cometh my salvation. He verily is my strength and my salvation. He is my defense, so that I shall not greatly fall. How long will ye imagine mischief against every man? Ye shall be slain, all the sword of you, yea, as a tottering wall shall ye be, and like a broken hedge. Their device is only how to put him out whom God will exalt. Their delight is in lies, they give good words with their mouth, but curse with their heart. 
Nevertheless, my soul, wait thou still upon God, for my hope is in him. He truly is my strength and my salvation. He is my defense so that I shall not fall. In God is my health and my glory, the rock of my might, and in God is my trust. O put your trust in him, all way ye people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our hope. As for the children of men, they are but vanity. The children of men are deceitful. Upon the weights they are altogether lighter than vanity itself. O trust not in wrong and robbery. Give not yourselves unto vanity. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God spake once and twice, I have also heard the same that power belongeth unto God, and that thou, Lord, art merciful, for thou rewardest every man according to his work. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here begin at the fourth verse of the 50th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He he wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and from spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall all wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Here endeth the first lesson. The Benedictus est Domine. Uh Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou for the name of thy majesty, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holiness, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and dwellest between the cherubim, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou on the glorious throne of thy kingdom, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven, praised and exalted above all forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here begins the 19th chapter, the 19th verse of the 11th chapter of the second epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise, For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, in labors more abundant, in strikes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. 
Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine, mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Here endeth the second lesson. The Benedictus. Uh-huh. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. The Colic for Sexagesima. O Lord God, who seest that we put not our trust in anything that we do, mercifully grant that by thy power we may be defended against all adversity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collects for Peace and Grace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by thy governance may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, today we continue our pre-Lent Sundays with Sexagesima, which means we're about a week and a half at this point away from Lent and about 60 days out from Easter. So if you were uh, at, 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 uh, at services last week, you may recall that these pre-Lent Jessima Sundays are the warm-up and the prep talk to prepare us for the race that is a Holy Lent. Now, as usual, our collect for the day gives us our main focus for the week. We prayed... O Lord God, who seest that we put not our trust in anything that we do, mercifully grant that by thy power we may be defended against all adversity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this prayer that we would 
turn our trust on God and his power rather than on anything that we do. It's an appropriate continuation of last week's theme. So last week in our collect, we recognize that we deserve punishment because of our sins, but we're delivered by God's mercy. In our gospel reading last week, we heard the parable of the vineyard where we saw that God rewards us generously with his grace rather than based on how much work we put in. After all, all the laborers received the same day's wage, whether they had toiled a full day or even those that had only toiled one hour. Yet in last week's epistle, we saw that we need to keep our eyes on the incorruptible crown of eternal life as we race a good race and fight a good fight that is the Christian life. So keep, we keep our eyes on the ultimate reward while realizing that we don't earn that reward by our own merits, but rather it's by Christ. So similarly, we begin our collect today by the acknowledgement that we cannot trust in our own deeds, but we require God's power to be defended against our enemies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. However, if we do not put our trust in anything that we do, why is it that today's epistle reading seems to see St. Paul boasting? This is especially strange when we see that the pre-Reformation collect for Sexagesima included a, a clause that specifically points us to St. Paul's doctrines as a source for God defending us. Yet St. Paul begins our reading with sarcasm towards both the Corinthians and his adversaries. This is odd indeed. So if you'll open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 11 verse 19, we read this. Ye suffer fools gladly seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. So Paul has a very complex relationship with the church in Corinth. From what we can tell from the two epistles to the Corinthians that we have and the brief passages about that church in the Acts of the Apostles, um, we see that Paul had planted the church in Corinth, but things quickly went off the rails, likely due to some false apostles sabotaging the ministry and undermining the gospel with some kind of legalistic or, or either legalistic or hedonistic or maybe both, ironically, form of Jewish Christianity. <clears throat> When Paul and Timothy later visit the Corinthians, they find open rebellion against Paul's apostolic authority, and Paul leaves. He, he, he basically gets run out of the church. And this leads to some very blunt follow-up letters from Paul as he tries to sort things out. So by the time we get to the, epist the second epistle to the Corinthians, which is probably actually his fourth letter to him, we just don't have the other ones, most of the church seems to have repented, but there was still a rebellious minority that didn't think Paul was successful enough, um, charismatic enough, Jewish enough, and well-spoken enough to be a true apostle. Instead, these folks were allowing the false apostles to both flatter them and spiritually abuse them with their false teachings. So this is the context of Paul's opening sarcasm. He basically says to them, hey, you gladly suffer fools because you're too wise to see their foolishness. You're happy to let these folks enslave you, devour you, take advantage you, exalt themselves at your expense, and even slap you on the face. Pardon me, Paul says, if I'm too weak to do that sort of thing. <laughs> he then goes on to say that if they want foolishness, He'll give them some foolishness. And that's where we get, pick up with the uh, second half of verse 21. How be it wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. So here we have the beginning of Paul's apparent boasting. But notice that he says all of this bo boasting is actually foolish speaking. He's lowering himself to the level of those false apostles to make a point, beginning with laying out his qualifications as a Jew. No one, he says, could be more Jewish than me, so let's take that objection off the table at once. 
And if they're questioning his apostolic qualifications, he'll answer that too. Again, acknowledging that to do so is stooping to foolishness. I love the ESV's rendering here. It says, I'm talking like a madman. Um, yet somewhat ironically, he points to his sufferings as proof that he's a better minister of Christ than those false apostles. Verse 23b, in laborers more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painful, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in testings often, in cold and nakedness. So like a modern day prosperity preacher, St. Paul's adversaries were saying that someone who was truly led by God wouldn't suffer. But Paul, like a madman, he says, boasts in those very sufferings. He was willing to do whatever it takes to follow Christ, to spread the gospel and to accomplish the mission that Jesus had given him. The need to speak to the foolish Corinthians on their own foolish terms is in some way providential for us because we only have a glimpse of some of these sufferings in the book of Acts. And what that tells us is that for Paul and for Luke, the one who wrote Acts, all of these sufferings were just part of what it takes to do their duty as apostles. They were really no big deal in the big scheme of things. And indeed, didn't the Lord himself tell St. Paul that that would be his job when the Lord first appeared to him on the road to Damascus? He said, you are going to suffer a lot of things for my namesake. And there's an implication in Paul's litany of sufferings that the sufferings were for the sake of those very Christians who are fighting against him. He suffered so that they could hear the gospel and be saved. And indeed, it's the care of God's people that is the true basis for any boasting. Verse 28, besides those things that are without, that's with cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. So because Paul is entrusted with the care of the churches, their weakness becomes his weakness. Their troubles are his troubles. And if Paul must boast, those are the things that he can truly boast about. Not his own works, but what God is doing in the church. Throughout all of St. Paul's sufferings, we see that it was God who defended him, God who preserved him. The gospel was worth suffering for. And really, if the Lord Jesus himself suffered for our sakes, why should we expect an easy road when we follow him? I'm looking forward to joining Bishop Seeley, Father Richardson, and other pilgrims this Lent when we literally follow the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering in Jerusalem. We'll pray the stations of the cross in the very place where those events occurred. Yet, following our Lord in his sufferings is less about a pious pilgrim devotion and more about dying to self as we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And as our colleague said, we can trust the Lord to defend us in that fight. As much as we must run a good race and fight a good fight, we don't have what it takes to fight that battle, to win that battle. No, like St. Paul, we must rely on the Lord Jesus to defend us, even as we answer his calling to take up our cross and follow him. In the prayer book's tradition, the main reason that we commemorate the saints is that we see that in them examples of God's faithfulness and examples of human beings living faithfully. Lent is a time when we come face to face with the foolishness of the world's boasts. We confront the lies of false gospels, false teachings, and indeed false teachers, whether they be out there in the world or whether they be wolves within the church itself. 
And indeed, there are many wolves in our own Anglican communion that would lead us to perdition if we follow them. That's why we battle our inclination to self-sufficiency with the discipline of prayer. That's why we battle our inclination to self-indulgence with the discipline of fasting. That's why we battle our inclination to greed with almsgiving. That's why we prepare to have a Holy Lent. And we do this not on our own strength, but on God's. We do this not on our own wisdom, but by the words of Holy Scripture. We do this not trusting in our own deeds to save us, but trusting in the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to live and die and rise again for us, so that we would be united to him in the fellowship of the Blessed Trinity. And we say all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll conclude with the prayer, the prayers for those in civil authority and the other concluding prayers. O oh Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States and to all in authority wisdom and strength to know and do thy will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, and the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness, all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate. That it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we thine unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.